There was an old kind of motto a couple of years ago that was uh, Ubisoft is Nintendo meets Hollywood. Once you've played Far Cry, you will have dealt with what it means to kill people using a gun in a video game. Far Cry 3 is the story of a sauced up white boy named Jason Brody. He and his group of Hollywood friends visit Bangkok, Thailand in order to escape their easy lives of luxury. They party in a remote section of the world and skydive over unmarked territory. In a way, they fall from heaven, plummeting into a strange paradise. Unknown to the group, they land in a world of hurt, a world where they are tested against forces greater than their comfortable lives could have prepared them to face. They land on the Rook Islands, home to the Rakyat, a tribe of natives but also hostage to pirates and powerful mercenary factions. While there, Jason is tasked by the natives with saving them from the tyrannical powers at hand. Voss, Citra, and Hoyt reign in blood-soaked supremacy, facilitating drug trade and slave rings throughout the islands. With the power of the mystical Tatao and many, many mind-altering substances, Jason is given trials to push him into becoming something greater, a warrior worthy of legendary status. It is up to Jason Brody to rescue not only his friends, but the whole of the Rook Islands from the perils of Hoyt, the true mastermind behind the slaughter. I just, I need to log in to my, to my Ubisoft account first. I need to remember my login. Thank God they have this login protected so that nobody can get my my copy of Monopoly. I could end up getting some serious flack for this. This isn't just a beloved game of the past, it's considered a masterpiece in some online circles. But as someone who played it the year after it dropped, I just couldn't find the reason for the praise. I searched high, and I searched low. I even played the whole thing just to make sure I wasn't missing what everyone else adored about the story. For the sake of gaining a thorough understanding of the scope and mechanics of the game, I even played it twice before editing this video. I also did a fair amount of research before picking the game Game up. There's this article by John Walker, the co-founder of online gaming journal Rock Paper Shotgun. It's an interview with the head writer of Far Cry 3, a Yale alumni by the name of Jeffrey Yohalem. It was a fascinating read, as the two become very, let's say animated about the topic. When the game released, critics were quick to identify problematic elements in the narrative, and the interview concerns this very subject. It has so many little chestnuts, like when Walker picks up that Yohalem is defending the game by destabilizing traditional video game narratives, he asks the following. Would you suggest that one of those destabilizations is what has been perceived as racism? Yes, it's not. It's the opposite. The game is the opposite. The game's argument is that Jason is basically used by everyone on the island. Jason is basically a gun that is upgraded by the natives on the island. The natives are not real, they're a metaphor. But as for what the natives are supposed to represent, or why they've chosen Jason, and what he represents, that's all left unsaid. I'll cover the whole article, but before I do so, I need to fill you in on the context, because if Yohalem were to have it his way, his explanation of the game would be a more accurate experience than actually playing the thing. Far Cry 3 determined Ubisoft's whole trajectory going forward. The game's resounding success signaled a new wave of development in its wake. Every following Far Cry release had to have the key elements that made it stand out. You need to have the open world, the shoot and loot, and the quintessential villain. Michael Mando's performance as Voss Montenegro is such a highlight of this game that they not only slapped his face on all of the marketing, but they still, to this day, attribute his performance as a standout role in the game's success. I don't think the team really knew what they had until Mando slipped into Voss's skin. Do you think for a moment that this is lost on the executives at Ubisoft? I want a cheeseburger, pussy, and a cigarette. Absolutely not. They've been trying to recapture Mando's lightning in a bottle acting all the way up to the most recent installment. When I initially auditioned for Ubisoft, the character of Voss did not exist. The part was initially written as 6'6", 280 pounds, very sociopathic, stoic, unemotional. And I took leave it with it and I gave him anything but what they were looking for. But you still run the line the same way you want to? Yeah. And you'll pull back on, you know what's coming. And obviously, 
I did not get the part. <laughs> but I get a call a few weeks later saying, Ubisoft liked your audition so much, they're creating this small character based on the audition you had done. They went and hired Gus from Breaking Bad just to try and siphon off whatever Mando-like talent they could to sell more reskins of Far Cry 3. In Far Cry 4, it was Pagan Min. Far Cry 5, Joseph Seed. Far Cry New Dawn, you have Lou and Mickey. And in the Far Cry movie, it was the director. This is Jack Carver in a good mood. <laughs> Those puck chasing Canadians can try all they want, they won't get another boss, and they won't get another Far Cry 3. Which is a shame, because the game is more than just another title on a franchise. It was a definitive turning point for shooters, as it employed some experimental facets of gameplay and storytelling that just aren't possible with AAA titles today. Audiences received the game very well, which is par for the course when it comes to any shooter that waves its hands in the air and says, oh look at how rich and complex my story is. Critics, however, were more lenient than it may have deserved in my opinion, which I will explain over the course of this video. Which is only, oh, well, it's actually quite a bit longer than I expected. Well, it can't be that complicated, right? Right? Maybe the best way to understand Far Cry 3 as a game is to get the context of when and where it was made. They have open season above Far Cry 2 on the, on the wall there? Okay. Okay. I guess, I guess they're proud of that. I, I haven't played that one. It was a stark departure from the previous two installments in the series, which were pretty dissimilar from one another to begin with. Far Cry Senior is the story of Jack Carver, a simple ferryman who gets in over his head when transporting Valerie Cortez to an island in Micronesia. The title was made by the same developer that would later make Crisis, the game that turns your desktop into a space heater. For those not in the know, this game was used as a benchmark to determine the graphical abilities of PCs. Can it run Doom? and Can It Run Crisis are two ends of a spectrum for determining the computational power of your device of choice. Far Cry 2 is more in line with what you might come to expect of a series going forward with some significant alterations from the first game. For one, it took place in a fictional African country on the verge of civil war, adopting a much darker tone than seen previously. Director Clint Hawking states that the setting and themes were inspired by Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which dealt with the evils of European colonialism from the perspective of a white sailor. It was more ambitious and was praised by critics for doing something so different for a AAA title in that it not only shoes the premise of the first game away, but embraces realism and centers the story around the deeds of the villains. For an example of realism, they incorporated aspects like your guns getting jammed and breaking over time, as well as the element which has embedded itself in the series being the healing animations. Pop bones back in the place, carve bolts out of your arm and wrap yourself up in bandages, all of which caters to a realistic portrayal of armed combat. As for the villain of the game, it was a man known as the Jackal, hinted at being the protagonist from the first game, Jack Carver, who turned to distributing arms in a third world conflict. Far Cry 2 would come out in 2008, and development on the third game would begin that same year. However, the original creative team behind the second game was scouted by competition like Blizzard and LucasArts, and was gutted by the year 2010. The office at Ubisoft Montreal became a different crowd altogether, and once again a new creative team was conceptualized. Jeffrey Yohalem becomes the head writer, and Patrick Plourd becomes the main director. Mark Thompson was level designer and talks at length about the challenge of developing an organic, dynamic environment that caters to Yohalem's ambitious storytelling. The team recognized critique in Far Cry 2 with mechanics like weapon degradation and bare bones open world and sought to do the opposite of what their predecessors had accomplished. They wanted fun at any cost and built the densely populated Rook Islands as a result. This is the setting most fans of the series first encountered. It's home to a dull, stereotypical tribe called the Rakya which translates literally into the people. They serve no significant position in the story other than being walking, talking, guns, and background props. The only significant members of these natives in the story are Vas Montenegro and his ultra-masculine cutthroat sister, Citra. One is crazy, the other is incestuous, and the pair make for an ugly depiction of native Indonesians. Every other islander is a nameless NPC, either idling nearby or donning red to indicate that they're the enemy. The main players in the story are almost unique 
unanimously white, leaving out Liberian-born Dennis. The protagonist, his friends, Dr. Earnhardt, Buck, Hoyt, Sam, and Willis, however, are all Caucasian. So what you have is a richly built civilization with intricate narrative weaved into the background, only for the foreground to be comprised of mostly whites. All this Indonesian foundation only to platform an annoying group of American kids who are responsible for the murder of dozens, potentially hundreds of natives. This bloodshed, by the way, facilitating a coming of age story anyone is supposedly able to relate to. Yohalan would have you believe that this was done in the name of satire, that these dumb, lazy tropes were implemented in order to make a point about how every other game thoughtlessly showcases these ideas. The only problem with that is that Far Cry 3 is then just another game that showcases these tropes. I think the story earnestly tries to explore these topics, but fails to actually promote any clear message other than killing is bad, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I need to actually tell you what the story is, so let's begin. We start with Californian friends partying in Bangkok, enjoying a rowdy expedition paid for with generational wealth. We get a montage of their worry-free escapade through southeastern Asia to the tune of MIA's Paper Planes. Hey, cheers, hey, shout out to my brother Riley for filing his pilot's license. Where is that freaking guy? Where, oh, there he is. Clearly from the get-go, we're meant to understand these characters as well-off, immature, and inherently disagreeable. This is such a slim, utterly minute percentage of the population that might have picked up the game, so we're likely meant to recognize their wealth and confidence as enviable, even though their actual character is resultingly despicable. The gang's fun is cut short after a skydiving trip lands them in the clutches of a criminal organization and the fish out of water story begins. Suddenly, the illusion of paradise is disrupted by the crazed monologue of a man behind bars. <laughs> I'm sorry, what did you say? What did you say? I want a cheeseburger. At first, he seems to mock you from a makeshift prison until the protagonist, Jason Brody, turns his head, revealing that it's the reverse situation. You, the player, are instead in captivity, the power clearly in this madman's hands. This sets up a theme of defying expectations, flipping the script on conventional tropes, but as I've spelled out already, the game really only enacts this theme on a surface level. Thanks to the handiwork of your brother Grant and his army experience, you escape captivity at the cost of a random islander's life. This happens twice in the prologue, as Grant soon takes another man's life in a confusing knife throw. Maybe it seems odd that I point out there's any death whatsoever in a game where you slaughter so many, but these first kills are supposed to be meaningful. They're quick and in the hands of Jason's more experienced older brother, but for Jason, they're the first time he's seen someone die. Grant needs to reassure Jason of their safety shortly before losing his own life to the crazed man from before. While armed, the man gives Jason a chance to escape after making it so far out of the camp, but this pushes Jason to kill a man in self-defense, the first fatality wrought from his own hands. He eventually escapes, which gives Jason the opportunity to meet Dennis. Dennis is a foreigner to the Rook Islands, but has adopted their customs since his arrival and ushers Jason into the warrior tradition by inking his skin in animal symbolism. Jason is told his friends are still in the hands of the men who captured them initially and is thusly equipped with the tools available to the islanders for their saving. The scenario is a win-win for the Rakyat and Jason, as eliminating the pirates could save Jason's friends as well as removing their unwelcome presence from the island. Yohalem frames this as Jason becoming a tool for the Rakyat to wield against the pirates, but the story sets up the odds against the protagonist to such a degree that this interpretation is a difficult read in my opinion. It also doesn't factor in how the strings are ultimately being pulled by another white man, Hoyt, making the whole situation the proxy war for two rich westerners. This then brings the Rakyat down in position to that of a festering, malicious tribe if we consider Yohalem explanation to be the correct interpretation. They're not a people fighting a righteous cause, but a staunch group of traditionalists embattled with a poor, outcasted criminal element making the best of a bad situation. But none of this is ever discussed within the confines of the game, only hinted at through interpretable lines of dialogue from main characters and then explained in an interview after the fact. So at this point, I'm inventing a deeper understanding of the context for the battle at hand than the game ever addresses. It's simply depicted as good versus evil, blue versus red, 
black and white morality. The story has to reposition the antagonists as evil again and again by having them murder in creative and cruel ways just to remind the player that they, the opposing team, are the evil ones, not the side which invariably racks up the most on-camera kills. Voss and Hoyt do unjustifiably heinous things, but because they're so demanding of the player's attention, it's never considered that, for example, every single unnamed red shirt pirate is voiced by one guy. The next story beats are Jason rescuing his friends from various plights. Purple Shirt is poisoned but kept safe by a drugged out chemist named Dr. Earnhardt. Jason gets her an antidote and talks the doctor into letting him stow his friends there with him. Main character's girlfriend is held prisoner by Voss aboard a beached boat called the Medusa, which is a reference to the first Far Cry game. Jason goes to rescue her but is ambushed and left to die in a burning building, but escapes in a chase sequence. On his way to finding Yellow Shirt, Dennis walks Jason into a ruined temple, which is used as a courtyard for Citra, sister to Voss and leader of the Rakyat. Fine work. I'll give it back to you after I cut it off. <laughs> I thought you liked jokes. They share some incredibly painful dialogue before Citra gives Jason a potion that lets him see the future. You know how indigenous brown people are inherently magical? Let's not make this weird, all right? Jason follows the vision to find Agent Willis, an American implant who really doesn't do anything at all but enable missions like where you get to listen to Skrillex and burn weed farms. He then sends you to another guy who was able to locate the yellow shirt friend. Another chase sequence ensues and the two of you make it back to Dr. Earnhardt's. Willis points you to Buck, who bought your friend Keith as a sex slave. Hard to come up with a silly little title for the character that's essentially a mute rape victim for the entire game so I just won't. The head writer treats the subject with so little respect that his only point to make is that in Far Cry 3, they flip that common trope of rape for shock value by having the victim be a guy. And, and then that, that's it. There's no greater commentary in the game. Keith is so traumatized by what happened to him that he remains mute the rest of the game. Apparently, because I'm sourcing the excusing interview from Rock Paper Shotgun, this further complicates the trope by avoiding giving the rape subplot a satisfying conclusion, because that's what satire is all about, half-assing sensitive topics and pretending something grand has been said on the subject. Buck has Jason run around the island looking for the knife Jason saw in his potion-induced dream, and eventually you kill Buck with that very knife and rescue Keith. I should cane you for that. I really should. The knife is given to Citra and she recites the mythological origin of the island, which tells of a warrior coming from the north and severing the head of a territorial giant. Citra relates this origin to the adventure of Jason, naming him as the northern warrior and the giant as the criminal presence on the islands, because it was foretold in the prophecy, of course. We're then introduced to the mercenaries that work closer in hierarchy to Hoyt as they transport Voss in what seems to be an elaborate and frankly stupid trap. We're then treated to the death definition of insanity speech, gets sent into a harrowing quick time event, what a nail biter. Jason then steals a copter, gets shot down, and Voss delivers the line once more before delivering a bullet directly into Jason's chest. He survives, again, because he's the main character, and we visit Citra once more. She gives you another drug or potion or whatever, and Jason hallucinates the origin story as a literal battle between himself and the giant. The fight with the giant is pretty whatever. It's definitely the point in the game in which it loses steam with regard to the story. Defeating this boss fight flashes the player with Citra's bare chest before Jason turns to reveal this was happening in front of a crowd of warriors, drugged out sex in front of dozens of shirtless men. Is is this part of the satire anymore? What, what do the uh, Alice in Wonderland quotes have to say about this one? Jason infiltrates Voss's hideout and we're treated to what is in my opinion the most successful hallucination sequence in the game. Voss drives a glowing knife into Jason's chest which reveals a static television path. Beside the path are vignettes of visual metaphor. Listen here, it's my script, I'll pronounce it how I want. There's a whole video behind an interpretation called the Symmetry Theory, produced by Ryan Hollinger. I'm referencing it pretty heavily here as it really highlights what works well with this sequence. Through this scene, Jason walks down the static path, revealing images of Jason holding a gun to his head, flashing intermittently with Voss's character model. There's a dance pole with Citra performing on it, flashed with Voss's model again. And finally, we have Jason or Voss having sex with Citra on the ceiling. The 
effect is depicting how the stories of Jason and Voss are one and the same, both forced into making the best of a bad situation and turning into monsters as a result. The interpretation lends a sympathetic tone to Voss's story, where the rest of the game reinforces his unequivocal villain status. In this case, the reading is intelligent and a genuinely deeper look into what the story could be about, but in my opinion it's too little and by this time in the game, too late. There is no other sympathetic treatment to the situation in the main narrative and the relation of Voss to Citra only seems to call attention to the fact that Citra betrays Jason at the end of the game. Uh, spoilers, I guess. At the end of this sequence, Jason stabs Voss repeatedly before they both collapse to the floor below, where Voss does this. Ollinger notes how this is a sign that the torch has been passed to Jason, that in Voss's death, he is reincarnated as less than an individual and more a symptom of a larger problem. Man, I wish the rest of the game reflected this in any way, because that's a pretty cool narrative, but instead the theme is dropped and Jason continues doing bad things until nearly the end of the game. Jason returns to his friends to tell them that his mission isn't over yet and that he doesn't want to return to Hollywood with them. He takes a plane to Hoyt's Island in order to make contact with Willis's inside man, Sam Becker. You play poker with him while disguised as a mercenary and give him the signal that you're friends with Willis. He comes up with a plan to disguise Jason as a mercenary and attend a meeting with Hoyt. Jason finds traitors and takes them out for Hoyt, Hoyt then butters up Jason with the prospect of the slave trade business before sending him up to brutalize his own brother. Then there's some drawn out missions with Sam and Jason where they blow up a portion of the criminal empire Hoyt has built up. Hoyt stabs Sam after a game of poker, revealing that he saw through Jason's disguise the entire time. Hoyt severs a finger before a QTE fight ensues, which kills him. Jason and his brother take a copter back to Dr. Earnhardt's, but when they arrive, the house is burning and Earnhardt is dying. He tells you that Citra took your friends, and when you arrive, she drugs you again. She has a ritual to perform so that Jason can fulfill the warrior origin story. The hallucination fades, and the player is given a choice between option white and option black. Kill your friends and join Citra, which ends in your death or spare your friends and leave the island, which kills Citra. The game tries to make a deal out of this choice, and the story is built up to this point, but it rings shallow to me. For one, Jason has been entirely absent from the friends and their worries, whether the player wanted to be or not. There are some optional dialogues available here and there, but the game in no way incentivizes these scenes to occur, and at every chance dissuades the player from interacting with the friends. Jason himself often blows them off in cutscenes, which signals to the player that there's little to care about here. The rest of the game is outside of the cave. The collectibles, the adventuring, the shooting is all taking place outside. All that's inside there is a collection of people who take a back seat to the real characters. Every time you go to save a friend, they're paired up with a real personality. Purple Shirt was your way of meeting the silly drug addict doctor. Girlfriend was your second meeting with the front cover character and series favorite Voss Montenegro. Yellow Shirt was the introduction to the enthusiastic patriot agent Willis. Keith saving took up a good portion of the middle, all of which was fronted by punchy sex fiend Buck, and your brother was only revealed after Jason completely dismissed his friends and then the meeting with Sam and Hoyt took place. Finally, the ultimate choice comes between the characters who have had no narrative or gameplay function besides becoming various princesses to your knight in shining armor or just killing them. Yohalem tries to argue in this interview with Rock Paper Shotgun that Citra is a Princess Peach in all of this, which is absurd. Jason's girlfriend is the useless in need of saving character throughout the game. Citra is... I mean, closer to an item block, if anything. She upgrades your abilities to run, gun, and have fun, empowering you through the whole game, and then, uh-oh, Poison Mushroom. She's captured your friends, now make a choice between the good option and the bad. Save your friends like you're opaquely supposed to, or go the way the game has been hinting towards Jason wanting to go. Yohalem says this is a choice which reflects what kind of person you are like it's a trolley problem or something. In reality, you're either paying attention to the shooting and feel no special ways towards the friends, or you're at the end of the game and go, oh, there's a choice to be made? I guess I'll save my friends, that seems right. 
game ends. It's a well-informed choice, but there's no reason to save your friends other than recognizing that it is the good ending. There's no other point in the game where you're given the choice to do the good thing. You're taking on the linear narrative that they had planned out, and then at the end, there's a shoehorned option to get the bad ending just for the fun of it. Just because there's a choice present doesn't mean there's an interesting path on either side or that the choice has any real meaning anyhow. Yohalem admitted that he expected people to go and Google the other ending anyway, so it's really just a choice as to which ending you want to see first, not an ethical dilemma. It's not really a trolley problem when for hours beforehand, the one person gives you your money's worth of a game and the five people have had very little to do with your adventure thus far and are even considered to be obstacles to the fun. The one person is a character. The five are annoying road bumps on a tropical island shoot -em up. On top of this, the choice isn't even presented as being between killing one or letting five die. It's presented as Jason leaving the island or killing innocents. It makes the distinction between the good ending and the bad ending so bleedingly obvious that it's almost no choice at all. At the end of the game, you're essentially presented with a prompt that makes you go, well, I wonder what this button does. It's shallow and surface deep, just like much of the story is to begin with. In juxtaposition to this, the gameplay is deeper and much more satisfying. However, if you noticed, I've been able to tell the whole story of this game without showing one real moment of gameplay. In the Rock Paper Shotgun interview, and on numerous occasions otherwise, Jeffrey O'Hallam makes the claim that the game is about shooting. Once you've played Far Cry, you will have dealt with what it means to kill people using a gun in a video game. And that's on every level. It's on the level that the, you know, the gamer who's playing the game will experience uh, a dialogue about what a shooting game is about. And I don't mean a literal dialogue, I mean a metaphorical one. Um, uh, we are creating an, an entertaining experience. So this is gonna be like Pulp Fiction, which was about redemption, but you lived through this incredible story in the meantime. You're gonna live through the story and it's gonna talk about uh, shooting in games, it's gonna talk about uh, social control. That the story concerns the very notion of what it means to pick up a gun in a video game. The only problem with this is that the gunplay and the cutscenes are entirely separate halves of the game and don't actually have much to do with one another. Sure, the context of each cutscene is how far Jason's come, but the meta context is that there are parts of the game where you talk to people and when those are over, the gun part comes back in. Yohalem specifically quotes the idea of ludonarrative dissonance being a key factor in development. He wanted to write a game that told the story of someone who gets lost in his strange, bloody fantasy, which is the strongest correlation Far Cry 3 has to Alice's adventures in Wonderland. That story gets told, but solely through the means of non-skippable cutscenes, and while there's nothing inherently wrong with that, it leaves more to be desired. The greater use of games as a medium would be to remove the chaff. Don't just have gunplay that leads to the next story-riddled cutscene. Give me the story in the gunplay. The reason a game like Fallout New Vegas has staying power is because the game is all game. Yes, I'm examining New Vegas now. This is officially H-Bummer Light. In New Vegas, the gunplay isn't just a satisfying combat system, but a mechanism used to enact story, and the talking bits are still engaging gameplay as well. What makes Boone such a memorable character is the synthesis of action and drama he showcases. Using something as simple as equipping an item from your inventory, the prearranged signal results in the ex execution of a target guilty for selling out residents of Novak to slavers. Now that's diegetics, baby. The scene that stands out the most from Far Cry 3 is the dubstep-filled set piece where you torch a marijuana farm to the ground, and it only stands starkly contrasted to the rest of the experience because of how jarring the scene is. It comes out of left field and isn't a moment that really deserves the backing, nor did the track match up with what was playing out on screen. It is, however, the closest Far Cry 3 comes to telling a story through action, but even then it's still meekly populated with red sandbags. See, if the end of the game was going to land with a good versus bad choice, then those choices should have been sprinkled not just earlier in the story, but throughout the combat as well. Do I get to interact with the targets I'm shooting? Do I get to choose which targets to let live? Do I get to shoot my gun in a meaningful way? Resoundingly, all knows. Every pirate is voiced by a single voice actor, Kwasi Songwe. I highlight this because it gives the player an early sense that it's going to be uncomplicated and that killing and shooting these guys isn't reprehensible because they're so clearly just enemies in a video game. Again, this can simply be claimed as satire that the simple notion of slaughtering hundreds is what's being commented on, but at the same time it falls short of actually addressing anything with it. The aspect is never acknowledged, never at the forefront, and never anything more than Mario stomping Goombas on his way to the next cutscene. The concluding idea is that killing is 
wrong, that Jason was actually bad this entire time, but the player knew that going into the game. Jason was a flawed character from the start, and stays a flawed character until the very end, when there's suddenly a choice to watch a weak excuse for a good ending or the ending they clearly had planned from the start. I've seen Far Cry 3 described as a game that tells a story that only a game could, and that's just not the case. The story is told as a first person movie. The game itself is about upgrading your arsenal to take out harder and harder enemies. That isn't a commentary on what it means to kill people in a game, that's just killing people in a game and and pointing to the player and saying, that was a bad thing you did. If you wanted to comment on what killing someone in the game actually means, Jason should have killed this Andrew Tate looking guy and then went back to Amanaki Village and met his parents. Slaughtering so many people that the population number drops by a digit or two should hugely impact the resources, land disputes, social fabric, and history of the islands. But it doesn't. Can you imagine hearing on the news about how some American tourists went missing while in Bangkok only to be found later after they nearly wiped out an island of natives? That kind of explosive story spells out tragedy on part of the affected nation, but somehow we get this story told to us through the indifferent eyes of the guy doing the killing. So again, how is this any different from any other shoot 'em up? What, because you took some time to make the natives into savage stereotypes who thirst for blood anyway and then make a big deal about how killing is wrong? We know killing is wrong, that's why we reserve it for video games. You didn't say anything of interest, Jeffrey. You said what every other AAA title has, but you made the main character unlikable and claimed you were inspired by 19th century literature to give it the caveat of high art. And your dialogue sounds like you were inspired by Ted. This game is somehow about growing up and maturing, yet constantly shovels the most immature and underdeveloped ideas onto my screen. It's like I'm watching Rick and Morty without the abusers behind the scenes. Oh, what's that? Pat Plord allegedly had multiple misconduct filings while working as VP editorial for Ubisoft according to this document which was outlined by a group of Ubisoft employees trying to elaborate on why they were dissatisfied with the toxic workplace standards. Well, at this point, I'm surprised I haven't seen Voss in smoke shops. But as I said before, the gunplay is still fun. It's never questioned why, because this is Far Cry 3, but the guns in the shops sell for cheap and in variety. It'd be interesting if we saw why these guns were coming in so many models with customizations primed and brand new, but the gun fetishism is so unquestioned in the meta context once again. You have rifles, handguns, submachine guns, launchers, bows, shotguns, and specialty weapons. All of these feel pretty solid, but of course the more expensive, the better means you need to save up the money. However, your wallet can only hold so much before you need to upgrade it, and in order to upgrade things which aren't weapons, you have to hunt. Did you see me skin that animal? Well, no, you didn't. What you saw was a lazy facsimile of skinning an animal where an animation plays out the process without actually removing the hide from the corpse. You might think I'm taking undue pot shots at this point, but to that, I tell you this. Yohalem claims that this was actually intentional, and that it was further satire, because you would expect the game to have the skin removed, but that Far Cry 3, ever the needle in a haystack, doesn't do this on purpose. What that purpose is? Uh, to show that it's a video game. I guess. That's that's really the best that he could come up with. It's exceedingly clear that Yohalem was on the defensive from accusations of laziness and racism, and he never had the foundation to argue against them. Far Cry 3 is a poor performance all over, hardly a masterpiece as it's been claimed to be. It had decent gameplay, but a disappointing story, racked with mishandled tropes and characterizations of the setting in which it takes place. There is no quality payoff to the decent setup, and even the standout performance by Michael Mando wasn't enough to make the game good. I didn't set out to label this game as bad, because it's not terrible, but there are so many elements that are either poorly conceived or wasted on a disappointing product. I had fun with it, despite its problems, so I guess all I can say is that Far Cry 3 was a disappointment. Thank you for watching. I want to give a special shout out to my patrons, Red, Sunny, and Sean, as well as my 5,000 subscribers. You guys have stuck around this long and I appreciate that greatly. If you like this video, you know how to show me, and if you care to, please leave a comment below letting me know what you thought of it. I love reading comments of all kinds. It's, it's honestly so much fun uh, seeing people interact with my content. No matter if the reaction is good or bad, uh, it's just a really fun time seeing so many people interested in my silly little projects. So as long as you guys are showing me that you enjoy what I do, I get to keep doing it. So uh, yeah, again, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.